Glaucoma is interesting as a disease because not everybody needs treatment and a lot of people with glaucoma just need monitoring and checkups but that monitoring has quite a lot of cost involved there's quite a lot of burden of of travel and time for people just to have an, an eye checkup to make sure that their glaucoma is stable and doesn't need more treatment and one of the things that frustrates me is that um, sometimes people have scans or visual fields done at the optometrist close to home or with another doctor somewhere else and that often information is often much less useful to the other doctor than the person who is collecting it and so that's a way that data is lost and i think that losing data in a chronic condition like glaucoma is a is a tragedy that we should be avoiding and there should be one place where all the information on each person is kept electronically um, to minimize that data loss and maximize the value of each of the tests that we do and so my vision for the electronic systems of the future would be a, a big shared network for the um, recording of information about everybody's eyes in New Zealand um, because I think that would lead us to much more intelligent management of people with glaucoma. It would allow us to, um, <clears throat> to recognize when people were getting worse and recognize when people were safe and stable and didn't need extra attention. And that would uh, be more intelligent use of the resources we've got. And one of the ways that we could stratify people's risk and be more intelligent about the way we do our work um, is by incorporating other risk factors that we're still learning about, um, like genetics. <clears throat> it's now possible uh, to get a, a genetic risk score for glaucoma, which means looking at lots of genes in your, in your DNA, and each of those many genes, maybe 200 genes at the moment, contributes to your risk of glaucoma. Some might be a little worse than normal and increase your risk and some might be a little better than normal and decrease your risk and adding up all those small effects from many many genes can give you a risk score and that risk score is now um, increasingly uh, potent at predicting the lifetime risk for an individual and so if we could use those risk scores to modify the amount of monitoring that people have um, I think that that would be a very safe and smart way to reduce the burden on people who don't really need it. And then wouldn't it be nice if we could do visual field tests at home um, and that they were still safe and reliable and effective? Um, there are some devices being developed in, in Melbourne, one that's on like an iPad, one that's um, just on a regular home computer screen. Um, and they've got some quite clever ideas about tracking where your eyes are looking on the screen and um, detecting whether or not you've seen the target without requiring you to push a button. Um, so that can be good for uh, children or maybe people with a language barrier, possibly for people with memory problems and early dementia. Um, but I think the main advantage of these new technologies will be that they're convenient and, and work for people at home. Uh, when it comes to treatment, um, uh, all of our drops have some risk of side effects. We're lucky we've got latanoprost, which is um, our go-to drop for, for nearly everybody, because that's our most effective drop with the fewest side effects. Um, and it's once a day, nice and convenient. Um, but some people can't tolerate latanoprost or it doesn't work well for them. And it's certainly not the, the solution for all glaucoma. So there are some new drops that are emerging which have an additional advantage in that they improve the outflow of fluid from the eye through what's called the trabecular meshwork. I hope you can see my little arrow pointer on the screen. There's a, a structure at the edge of the iris where the iris meets the, the cornea. In this corner here, which is often uh, described as the angle of the eye, and there's a structure in there called the trabecular meshwork all these terms are very unhelpful. They don't um, give you any information. But the trabecular meshwork is the structure at the edge of the iris where most of the fluid in the eye is reabsorbed and taken back into the blood vessels along this arrow here, back into little blood vessels on the surface of the eye. 
and most of the drainage of the eye goes out through that pathway. And so when people have problems with high pressure, it's usually because of a failure of that pathway. And latanoprost works by increasing drainage through an alternative pathway. And none of our drops improve this conventional um, outflow through the trabecular meshwork. So this new drop called latanoprostine bunod and this other new drop called natacidil both have this new um, property that they improve this trabecular outflow. And the reason that that is um, of theoretical benefit is that improving that trabecular outflow, conventional outflow, reduces fluctuations in the pressure. And fluctuations in the pressure are thought to be harmful to the optic nerve on their own. So it would be, um, it would be expected from the from the theoretical basis um, that improving trabecular outflow lowers the pressure but also reduces fluctuations and that that has additional benefits in reducing glaucoma damage, I mean glaucoma progression. So how do they work? This is latanoprost, reduces the pressure by 25 to 30% on average, so that's a illustration of the amount of reduction that latanoprost on its own typically gives. This new one, latanoprostine bunod, 32 to 34%, so essentially um, it's like latanoprost on the best day. Natacidil, not as effective as latanoprost on its own, although it has these um, uh, theoretical benefits of reducing fluctuations, but you can combine it with, with latanoprost in a, in a single once a day drop and it might have um, a benefit 31 to 37% in the, in the trial there. So these drops of the future might have some theoretical advantages, um, but what I understand about both the new drops, Natacidil and Latanoprostine Bunod, is that they, they make your eye red even more than Latanoprost does, to the extent that they might not be better tolerated at all. And, and drops that make your eye red and weepy and irritable are not really a sustainable solution for people. So um, I think that, that rather than new drops being our solution for medical treatment of glaucoma, it may be that uh, seeking unpreserved drops that don't have preservative in them, that are gentler on the ocular surface and better tolerated might be a better investment, more cost effective than these new technologies. But it's nice to know that people are always working on improvements in the medicine for glaucoma. Uh, there are some intriguing ways that um, you could give medicine in a way um, there are intriguing ways that you could give medicine in a way that doesn't involve having to put in a drop each day. I've just noticed Pippa's question, which is, are there preservative-free drops being developed? Well, yeah, there are. They're already out there, but they're not available in New Zealand. So in Australia, you can get uh, latanoprost without a preservative and timolol without a preservative and probably others. Um, but in those patients of mine who've had a, a severe allergy to preservative, who really can't take any of the preservative uh, drops in New Zealand, um, they've had to go to their pharmacist and inquire about importing those drops specifically from Australia for them. And that's not something that Pharmac has, um, there's no pathway through Pharmac to get that funded. Um, so getting onto these new drug delivery systems. Um, I think some of these are quite ingenious. This is a ring that is um, silicon and soft and rubbery on the outside. And on the inside, the core of that ring has got um, Lumigan, Bimataprost drops inside. And you could very easily switch that out for Latanoprost. And, and it's sort of in a, a slow release core. And you can slip it up under your eyelid and slip it down into your lower eyelid so that it forms a circle around your eye, maybe just visible in the corner. Um, and apparently it sits there quite comfortably and you can change it every two or three months. Um, 
I quite like that idea because it seems very uh, safe and comfortable. And this is this is similarly clever. You put this little plastic plug into the punctum, into the, the tear duct that drains tears off your eye down into your nose. And you can replace this little pellet in the in the plug, uh, which is full of glaucoma medicine. You can replace that in the clinic and it just sits there in your eyelid for a couple of months um, before the little pellet needs to be replaced. And then this is a pellet, um, very small, like a, like a large grain of sand, um, which is implanted inside your eye on the tip of a needle. And uh, we've been part of um, international multi-center trials where we've been putting some of these little pellets into the eye of, of um, patients with glaucoma. And there is the same quantity of imatoprost in this little pellet as one single eye drop. But when it's inside your eye and doesn't blink away, that one pellet with one drop will last for four months, maybe for longer. Some people get, <clears throat> pardon me, some people get one of these little implants and they don't need a treatment for one or two years before the pressure starts going up. Um, they don't work for everyone though. And in some people, in a comparison with, uh, with SLT laser, which is a popular treatment that um, a lot of us are using, um, it's, it's not clear to me that this has an advantage over SLT laser. Um, but for some people, this might be great because you don't have to remember to put it in and the side effects are very few because it's inside your eye and it's not irritating the surface of your eye. Uh, so all of these technologies aim to reduce the amount of work that patients have to do to put their drops in and remember and reduce the side effects from putting drops in with all the preservative each day um, and hopefully reduce the um, amount of uh, visits to clinic and, and medical attention required. Now someone's asking about SLT laser. SLT is, a, is an acronym like you've spelt it out there stands for Selective Laser Trabecular Plasty, which again is just unhelpful jargon that doesn't give you any information. What happens in SLT laser is we, we put a, a lens on the eye, um, much like we do in the clinic where we're examining the eye and we put a lens on to uh, look into certain parts of the eye. And we flash a very brief flash of green laser light, click, 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 all around the hours of the clock and we're, we're shining it onto that trabecular meshwork, um, shining it onto the structure here with 80, 50 or 100 little flashes of green light around the circumference of the, of the drainage structure. And the SLT um, is such a brief flash of laser light, it's so quick, it's only three nanoseconds, that that doesn't allow heat to build up. So it doesn't form a burn the way that most of our lasers do. And that means that it's like a magic wand treatment. You sort of do the laser, flash, 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 and then you have another look and you can't see that you've done anything. It, it's sort of invisible. And because it's not leaving any burns or scars, it's very gentle and safe. And most people don't get any side effects from having the laser. And we, we understand that it is stimulating or irritating these drainage cells that live in this trabecular meshwork structure to make them work harder. I sort of say it's like clapping your hands and making them clean up their room and work a bit harder to pump fluid out of the eye. And SLT has been shown to be uh, quite a nice alternative to drops for people who are having side effects from drops or, or people who have trouble getting their drops in or keep forgetting them um, because you don't have to remember to do anything. Um, but like with all of our uh, other uh, gentle treatments. It doesn't work for everyone. It's not a solution for all types of glaucoma. Um, yeah, only open angle glaucoma and only relatively mild glaucoma. Um, there's lots of work out there on new types of surgery, and these often go by the acronym MIGS, which is minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And the idea is that standard glaucoma surgery is risky and um, not a particularly desirable thing to have 
because it doesn't make your vision any better. All it does is lower your eye pressure. And often in the process of having a glaucoma operation, it makes your vision more blurry. And there's um, significant ups and downs that people experience with glaucoma operations um, until things are hopefully more stable with a lower pressure. And so there are lots of devices that have been developed over the last 10 or 20 years trying to reduce the pressure, but also reduce the risk. And, you know, this one here is called Hydra, and I think it looks a bit like a coat hanger. And it goes into the corner where the iris meets the edge of the cornea. This is a view into the trabecular meshwork. And the Hydra implant is kind of implanted into the drain of the eye to try and hold it open. Uh, this one similarly is like a little collar stud, a little uh, studded tube that plugs in into that meshwork and you inject it on this kind of, um, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's an injector. It kind of springs the little uh, stud forward so that it plugs into the trabecular meshwork with the idea that the fluid of the eye drains down and out through these little holes on the side and that this improves outflow and lowers the pressure. And then the last one here is called a, a Zen tube, Zen spelt with an X, and you introduce the needle across the front of the eye and from the inside out you inject this tube which is soft like a noodle and allows fluid from inside the eye to drain out into the into this uh, soft tissue under the skin of the eye. And so that's like a way of doing trabeculectomy surgery, which is standard glaucoma surgery, but using without needing to use uh, stitches and cuts in the skin of the eye because you're coming from the inside out. And so each of these procedures has been developed with the idea that it reduces the risk compared to standard glaucoma surgery. Um, but because all of them are uh, small and light and quick and easy, none of them are creating a large and definitive uh, drain for the eye. And so it's, it's fair to say that none of them are as effective at getting very low pressures as standard glaucoma surgery, <clears throat> which means that we're still doing a fair amount of standard glaucoma surgery because none of these less invasive options have um, have yet been shown to be as effective. So I find it difficult in my practice to understand where these new devices fit in um, because they're really for people who have mild glaucoma but still want surgery or moderate glaucoma but not bad enough for a, um, a standard glaucoma operation. And, and I don't have many people in that mild category who want to have an operation. So the result of that is that I haven't, um, I haven't taken up many of these devices myself. I'm finding it hard to, to work out who are the people who, who really need them. Right, now we're getting on to some uh, ideas for the future that I'm, I'm really interested in. And these are the ideas of treating glaucoma more as a neurological thing um, than a plumbing problem with lowering the pressure. Lowering the pressure really works. Lowering the pressure is a great way of protecting the optic nerve. And for most people, lowering the pressure is all the treatment they need and is very effective in preventing vision loss from glaucoma. But some people have a very fragile optic nerve where even with a low pressure, the visual fields are still getting worse. And for those people with a, with a fragile and difficult type of glaucoma, there's a lot of interest in trying to protect the nerve and make it more strong so that if the pressure is fine, their optic nerve is fine and this should make their optic nerve more resilient. Now I've put this little picture of bromonidine drops up here to remind me that uh, we've already got neuroprotection. There was a, a trial that compared bromonidine drops with timolol drops and it showed that, uh, that the nerve seemed to be stronger and the visual field seemed to progress more slowly with bromonidine treatment. Um, and 
One of the challenges is that uh, bromonidine has um, much more side effects than timolol. And so the number of people who could keep taking bromonidine right through the trial was much less. And as a result, it was very hard to compare the two groups. And so people have um, spent a lot of time debating whether that study really showed that bromonidine was better or just that timolol was worse or that bromonidine had more side effects. And there's been a lot of debate about whether that um, trial really showed what the authors claimed it did. Um, and, and that's there as a reminder to all of us that proving that treatments will benefit your optic nerve and make your optic nerve stronger in the long run is a really difficult thing to do. The clinical trials that are required to demonstrate that a medicine is neuroprotective, those clinical trials are really challenging to get a meaningful result. So here are three um, possible uh, neuroprotective options that are kind of out there, um, but none of them are really proven to have any long-term difference on the survival of the optic nerve cells. Uh, so ginkgo is this beautiful tree uh, that's very ancient from the time of the dinosaurs. And extracts from the ginkgo plant have been used in traditional medicine, particularly Chinese medicine, uh, for centuries. And it's thought to have widespread health benefits in that alternative medicine space. And a lot of the uh, science that's been done on ginkgo suggests that it has beneficial effects on blood flow. Um, though, you know, often people oversimplify things. They say, well, if, if it makes your blood flow greater, then that must be good. Um, but it's not necessarily true that more blood flow is more beneficial. Anyhow, the ginkgo plant has quite a lot of uh, scientific studies indicating that the cells of the optic nerve are happier, healthier, and uh, survive, at least in the short term, better. Um, but nobody has done a trial that compares ginkgo extract with placebo tablets and shows any difference to the outcome of their glaucoma. Those kind of trials would be really expensive and there's no pharmaceutical company that has a lot of money to be made from ginkgo. So I don't know whether anyone will be able to do that big expensive trial and prove whether or not it helps. Uh, the next one I'd like to tell you about is vitamin B3, which is called nicotinamide. And uh, this is exciting because um, there was some relatively uh, robust and thoughtful analysis of the metabolism of optic nerve cells called retinal ganglion cells. And that led people to think that supplementing vitamin B3 to higher levels than, um, than we normally get from our diet might be beneficial to our optic nerve cells. And so they did a, a great study in Melbourne where they gave patients with glaucoma um, these uh, vitamin B3 supplements called Insola and found that the signal indicating a healthy, happy um, retinal ganglion cell were strengthened. Um, so even in, in human patients with glaucoma, giving them vitamin B3 seemed to make their optic nerve cells function better in the very short term, over a month or two. Um, and so that has stimulated them to start a bigger trial where they are um, randomly allocating people vitamin B3 supplements or placebo and looking at longer term outcomes that really matter in a gradual chronic condition like glaucoma. Um, so that one is uh, very promising, but still not proven. And then there are some uh, studies that are just kicking off uh, that are looking at molecules to, um, to block cell death and to therefore improve the survival of the optic nerve cells. And one of those is just about to get started in New Zealand and um, we're going to be one of the participating centers. So people who are 
uh, have a normal pressure, but their glaucoma is still getting worse, um, will be eligible to have this um, medicine, um, uh, I think it's an injected medicine, a single injection or maybe two injections, um, and it should uh, prolong the survival of their optic nerve cells. And there's some quite exciting technology um, to image the cells of the eye and the health of the cells of the eye and measure the signals as well as the long-term visual field results um, to see if it's really working. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to being part of that study. Well, now gene therapy is an exciting technology for the future because gene therapy involves changing the um, unhealthy genetic signals in the eye and the promise of gene therapy is that it's a, a single treatment that lasts forever or maybe not forever but lasts much longer than standard medicine which wears off you know we have to take eye drops every day to lower the eye pressure because the effect of the medicine diminishes every hour um, but with gene therapy the idea is that you can reprogram the cells that are sick so that the effect of the treatment lasts and lasts now this is an interesting idea there's a gene called myosilin and no one really knows what myosilin is supposed to do because if you if you knock out myosilin um, animals that have no myosilin gene seem to be healthy with normal eyes but some people and some animals have a mutant version of myosilin which um, uh, which causes problems so having no myosilin is not a problem but having a particular mutant myosilin can cause glaucoma and so this type of um, genetic glaucoma caused by this variant of myosilin um, explains two or three percent of glaucoma in our community so it's the most common cause for inherited glaucoma is this mutant myosilin and it uh, often causes uh, the problem of having a raised pressure with um, with steroid treatment you know often we need to give people steroid eye drops or they take prednisone tablets and that can cause a high pressure in the eye and that that raised pressure caused by steroids is often thought to be due to this variant in the myosilin gene. And so if we if we know that having no myosilin is not a problem, then we could just get rid of myosilin or all the people who have the bad myosilin. And you can do that, you can chop out bad genes using CRISPR. And so in this early animal model, um, giving the <clears throat> CRISPR, sig CRISPR signal that chops out myosilin was able to lower the pressure in these mice who had um, bad myosilin. So that's quite an exciting idea that you could have a blood test to see whether you've got the unhealthy type of myosilin. And if you do, then you could just put an eye drop in that had CRISPR targeting that bad myosilin and chop out the bad myosilin. And then that would be a single one-off treatment that would give you long-term improvement in your pressure by getting rid of the harmful gene. I think that's quite exciting. And then this is the gene therapy version of neuroprotection, which is where you, you program the cells in the retina to produce uh, beneficial medicine for themselves. And one of those potential uh, beneficial medicines is called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And this, this factor is important in the survival of nerve cells, in particular the optic nerve cells and it is diminished in eyes with glaucoma and so if you give somebody an eye with glaucoma brain derived neurotrophic factor it does improve the survival and the health of the, the optic nerve but only for a while you also need to give extra receptors so that the cell doesn't start ignoring the brain derived neurotrophic factor and so this amazing product which was developed in Cambridge by a mentor of mine who I think is a truly amazing individual. Uh, this product's called Qthera. It might have a new name now. And they have they've fitted in the, uh, the gene for the receptor and the gene for the, um, the neurotrophic factor into a single virus 
and you can inject that virus once and all your retinal ganglion cells, all your optic nerve cells, will produce factors that, that improve their survival. And the results are really very impressive um, and they're just about to start human trials, so that's really exciting. Here's a, here's a picture from a rat that they've injected this um, gene therapy product and shows that it's producing uh, the neurotrophic factor in the retinal ganglion cells, the optic nerve cells that we're interested in keeping. Um, and a, a similar image from the same paper shows that the receptors are also upregulated in those cells. So I'm excited about that possibility. Uh, it's just about to be uh, ready for people. So glaucoma technology of the future, I think that involves uh, reducing cost and reducing travel and increasing intelligence so that we are maximizing the benefit of our hospital clinic services. Often when we talk about technologies of the future, we think, well, we just need more eye scans and more detection for early diagnosis. Um, but what we really need is a smarter use of technology to improve diagnosis. We don't just want a whole lot more diagnoses that don't really matter. We, we want to be able to identify the people who are at risk of losing vision and look after them really well. And all the people who are not at risk, we want them to feel reassured and safe. Um, and so that's the nuance of glaucoma treatment uh, that requires an, an intelligent approach going forward. When people do need treatment, it would be ideal for the treatment to be easier, which means fewer eye drops, lower side effect profile, and part of that might be neuroprotection to make your optic nerve more resilient and uh, less susceptible to eye pressure. Cool, so I think that's my last slide and I would love it if there were more questions people wanted to talk about. Carol has asked about omega-3. Um, omega-3 is a, uh, a type of fat that is particularly um, found in high quantities in fish and for vegetarians you can get it from flaxseed and omega-3 is um, uh, it's kind of the the wonder treatment for everything these days you know good for heart disease reduces dementia and alzheimer's uh, makes people live longer with a, um, a shiny glossy coat but um, uh, i'm not particularly aware of a uh, a beneficial effect from omega-3 um, for uh, for glaucoma i know there's some quite promising um, findings that it is good for macular degeneration and it's definitely good for dry eyes and so often people taking glaucoma eye drops have dry eye symptoms and omega-3 supplements can be helpful for them um, but I'm not aware of whether omega-3 supplements are helpful for the survival and health of the optic nerve um, what do you think Papa? should we um, Oh yeah, here's a couple more questions coming through. There was uh, another one about lutein and krill oil. Yeah, krill oil is uh, recommended because it's um, it's it's full of omega three. One of the difficulties with these kind of alternative treatments and supplements is that in New Zealand, our um, these health products, these supplements, are regulated as a food instead of a medicine, and so the regulation is quite uh, soft. And that means that when it comes to doses and quality control, um, I'm not very confident about the, the products that are available in the health food shop, for example. So when I have patients with dry eyes and I'm recommending omega-3 to them, I usually recommend that they get products that are regulated in Australia because the quality control is, is so much um, tougher over there and you feel more confident that you're getting the dose uh, that it says on the bottle. Um, lutein is an antioxidant. Um, I think it's derived from colorful vegetables and it has been shown to be um, a minor advantage to people with macular degeneration. And again, I'm, I'm not aware of any particular 
science to show that it's helpful for optic nerve cells, um, but also I have no reason to fear that it would be harmful. Um, Vivian's asked about whether there is a correlation between blocked ducts and glaucoma and blocked tear ducts. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good question and unfortunately in ophthalmology we have all this really unhelpful jargon and even when we try to uh, summarize it and use terms like ducts it can be confusing because there are um, multiple potential ducts that people are talking about. So for example, when it comes to dry eyes, we have um, a lacrimal gland that produces watery tears and we have meibomian glands that produce oily tears. And sometimes people call those uh, meibomian glands um, tear ducts for some reason. Uh, but the main tear duct that people are talking about is the drain from the inner corner of your eye down into your nose, which is why if you're cutting onions or um, at a funeral or uh, crying for any other reason it, you get a runny nose is because your tears end up in your nose and so some people suffer from a blocked tear duct which tends to cause a weepy eye so constant painless watering of the eye is the symptom that people get when when their tear duct is blocked and that's often caused by um, infections causing the the duct to become scarred and blocked and so that that tear duct on the outside of the eye connecting the eye to the nose um, has a different sort of physiology to the drainage structures in the eye and so the drainage in the eye is through this trabecular meshwork structure and the the, the ducts that you might um, visualize in there connect the trabecular meshwork to the blood vessels and they they're quite a different sort of a structure um, to to the tear duct. So uh, dry eyes are very common, uh, particularly in older women. Um, glaucoma is common as people get older. Blocked tear ducts are increasingly common as people get older as well, but they don't cause dry eyes, they cause watery eyes. So um, I'm sorry Vivian, I'm not sure if I'm unpacking your question properly. Uh, there's a question from Ganga about um, COVID how COVID affects glaucoma. I am um, part of some email groups where hundreds of uh, ophthalmologists across um, America uh, discuss their, their uncertainties and, and ask questions of each other. And so in the last couple of years, I've just seen so many emails going around about do you think COVID is causing this and do you think COVID is causing that? Uh, and it, it can be really, really difficult because uh, things happen to human beings uh, on a random basis all the time. You know, some people have uh, spontaneous inflammation of a nerve randomly and who knows if today's the day that it's gonna happen to you um, or if you'll make it through your life without it ever happening to you. And so there's this randomness to, um, to health conditions and when something comes along like a pandemic which is affecting nearly everybody all at the same time it's really hard to detect whether the risk of these things happening is increased or decreased by um, by the virus or by the um, uh, by the vaccines which are also happening to everybody at the same time and so um, professor helen Danish Meyer from Auckland, who's um, the chair of glaucoma in New Zealand and well known to all of us who uh, think about glaucoma. Um, she did a big review recently on the sort of ocular manifestations, the potential side effects in the eye from COVID and from the vaccines. And there were certainly some inflammatory complications that were recognized to be more common in people with COVID or to a lesser extent, people with the, who've been vaccinated. Um, but I'm not, I'm not particularly aware that there was a, an increased risk of glaucoma related um, problems. Um, I had a, a, a big and detailed conversation with one of my patients who was 
very worried about getting the vaccine and he was trying to find ways to justify not having the vaccine because he was so stressed out about the side effect possibility. Um, and when I was looking into it, I couldn't, I couldn't really help him either way in terms of explaining whether or not um, his risk of side effects was increased or uh, his risk of glaucoma from COVID complications was increased. So I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a strong answer there. Um, there's a question about continuous eye pressure monitoring devices. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't put any of those into the um, into my talk. There, there are uh, two sort of technologies like that. One is a contact lens that goes on the eye and tries to estimate the pressure from the sort of um, tension on the surface of the eye. Um, and then the other is implanted in your eye when you have a cataract operation, um, a piece of technology that you can access from the outside using a spinning magnet. And, and both of those devices have some promising examples. I mean, there, there are some exciting papers that make it look like you can get continuous monitoring um, wirelessly and remotely from an implanted device. Um, but, but all of them are very much subject to noise and drift, which means that the long term kind of uh, usefulness of the information from these devices is, is less. So when it comes to home monitoring, uh, probably the most established option is called the eye care home. Um, eye care tonometers are a pressure testing instrument that is quite common in the clinic these days, and you might have seen one, and sort of shaped like a um, uh, a laser gun or something from a from a, a sci-fi movie, and it fires a, a very light, thin plastic probe. It bounces off the tip of your eye and so it normally goes beep 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 and gives you a number um, and the eye care tonometer is quite uh, useful i think it's quite reliable and it's particularly accurate in people who have an unusual cornea uh, maybe from surgery or infections or injuries to their eyes in the past and so that eye care technology is available in a device that you can use at home and it stores various measurements um, and in the first generation, the first sort of um, version of the eye care home, it would send the information to your doctor and you could chat about it when you went to the clinic next time. The current version allows you to test your own pressure and uh, see it immediately. And uh, I know that a lot of glaucoma doctors are uh, nervous about all the anxiety that that might create. That people might find that their pressure is 30 late at night and need to um, uh, call someone right away to discuss it and that sometimes uh, too much information is a bad thing mm. um, but uh, you know in principle i like the idea that we're all empowered to know as much as we can about our eyes um, and the trick is uh, making the technology as um, uh, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that um, measuring the pressure is just one data point that doesn't tell you about the severity or the progression of your glaucoma and having a, a snapshot of the pressure um, is just one uh, piece of the puzzle. Um, I, I think that's why there's concern that having um, continuous access to knowing your own eye pressure um, can cause uh, more harm and stress than, than benefits. Someone um, has mentioned that uh, laser is making them anxious and, and that's so so common that people um, are really uh, stressed out about um, about laser on their eye and so you know, some of the things I've suggested are even more invasive like injections and implants and things like that and um, uh, do I have any suggestions for how to uh, how to reduce anxiety? Well, I, um, I wish I had some that would be useful to tell you through the Zoom screen. Uh, when it comes to SLT, 
I feel really confident in recommending that to my patients because I can tell them that it is uh, as safe and as gentle as as using eye drops and that the, the procedure itself is no worse than the uh, experience of having your eyes checked in the eye clinic. So it's not painful or stressful or dangerous. But um, I, I, I don't know whether that is uh, of any help. Well, Pippa's asked a good one. It's controversial. It's about um, medical marijuana. Um, I, I did some of my training in Los Angeles. And if you go to the beach in Los Angeles, one of the beaches is called Venice Beach. And um, people are selling lizards and uh, uh, dream catchers and all sorts of weird things on the beach there. And as you're walking along and enjoying the view and the... Uh, the sort of unique atmosphere on Venice Beach. Um, this doctor comes up wearing green emergency department scrubs with a stethoscope around his neck and says, hey dude, have you got a headache? Uh, and you think for a moment, why would you? Ah, oh, you're, you're asking me if I've got a headache to see whether I want to have it cured with your medical marijuana. And you say, no thanks, I haven't got a headache. And the next question is, oh, maybe you've got glaucoma. And so, um, there are, there are doctors on Venice Beach who are very willing to treat your glaucoma with medical marijuana um, at the drop of a hat. And um, it is true that if you smoke marijuana, your intraocular pressure, your eye pressure goes down. Um, but it is thought that you would need to smoke eight joints a day to keep your intraocular pressure down and that that would prevent you from um, achieving much else in your day. Uh, so the, the follow on from that has been that um, uh, drug companies have tried to identify which molecules in the marijuana lower your eye pressure and turn them into eye drops, you know, like a, like a cannabis based eye drop to lower your eye pressure. And there have been some trials of those kind of technologies. Um, but none of them have really um, shown as strong an effect as smoking marijuana, which obviously has so many other effects on the person. And I think the reason for that is that there are multiple molecules in the marijuana plant. There's the THC, which is the one that makes people feel good and high. And then there's the um, uh, CBD, uh, which is available um, as an alternative health product. Um, and and multiple other molecules, of course. And it might be the particular balance and um, mixture of these molecules that has effects on the eye pressure. It might not be as, as straightforward as just finding the one molecule that you need. Um, someone's asking about whether the technologies are just for private glaucoma patients. Well, um, let me think about that. Um, at the moment, some of the trials are uh, being conducted only in private. Um, but, uh, but often if you're suitable for a trial and you're a public hospital patient, um, then you can participate in the trial in the private sector without paying for it. You know, if you're a trial participant, the drug company is paying and so you don't need to have insurance or pay your own for your own care if you're a, a trial participant. Um, when it comes to technologies um, that have been trialed and are available, uh, some of them are only available in private, but none of the really good technologies are blocked from the public sector. What I'm saying is that, um, for example, some of those minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries might not be available in the public hospital, um, but that's because they're not as effective as some of the other um, more conventional technologies. And so, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't want you to think that there were things available in private that you were blocked from having in in the public hospital mm. i'm sorry if you can hear my neighbor's dog is howling um 
I'm pretty sure that's not my dog howling. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that the oh, that um, uh, as as technologies prove themselves and show that they improve quality of life and that they improve um, uh, cost effectiveness and and save uh, time and money for for everybody. Um, then they are available in public as soon as they have proved their value. Um, mm. Yeah. All right. There's a, a long question from from Jenny, and I'm I'm sorry I, I I won't have a chance to answer that in front of everybody. Oh, Carol's asked one that really um, uh, pushes my buttons as well. There's, um, Carol's asking about sleeping position, um, and this is something that really interests me. At the moment, I'm I'm doing a study uh, where we tip people's tip people upside down on a on a tilting table so that their head is lower than their feet, and then we do um, eye scans with their with their feet in the air uh, and their head upside down, um, and that's because when we lie down, when we go flat, we know that the eye pressure goes up. But we also know that the head pressure goes up, and when it comes to the optic nerve, it's the relative, uh, the relationship between the eye pressure and the head pressure um, that is important, not the absolute value of either. And so, if when we lie down, our head pressure goes up more than the eye pressure, then it might be good for glaucoma patients to lie down. But if when you lie down, the eye pressure goes up more than the head pressure, uh, then Glaucoma patient, patients should uh, sleep in chairs. Um, but we don't really know that. And so this study that I'm doing with the tilting table tries to um, tries to access that using the OCT scan. I think we're getting close. There was a news article about um, an implant to help patient regain sight. Uh, well, I... I didn't see that story, so I can't really um, can't really answer that. But um, regaining sight in glaucoma requires optic nerve regeneration, and that is um, described by the American National Institutes of Health as an audacious goal, mm -hmm. meaning that it is a a fifty year project um, to see if we could make that happen. What it would mean is injecting some healthy stem cells of some sort into the eye and then creating all the signals that would be required for those cells to find the right part of the eye to connect to and then grow their nerves across the back of the eye out through the optic nerve all the way back to the right parts of the brain. And those pathfinding signals that are present when we're developing are not present when we're adults. And so optic nerve regeneration seems to be an extremely challenging uh, moonshot for the future mm -hmm. um, because the uh, connecting the new cells to the right part of the brain um, yeah is just a, a huge challenge mm. Pippa um, I see that time's marching on but you've asked another really great question to finish up which is how do patients get on the trials um, and that's tricky because different practices are participating in different trials. Um, so I guess all I can suggest is um, asking when you're in the clinic uh, if there are any trials happening at the moment that you might be eligible for. Because uh, usually the trials are very restrictive in who would be eligible. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's usually just a, a small number of patients. But as I said before, if you're a public hospital patient in a busy, heaving public hospital clinic that we're all familiar with, um, you're still uh, just as eligible to be a trial participant as if you're at the fanciest, most expensive private practice. 